He is a member of the Council on Foreign Relations and the London-based International Institute for Strategic Studies. His commentary on the peace process and the Arab-Israeli conflict has appeared in Foreign Affairs, The New York Times, The Washington Post, Los Angeles Times, The Wall Street Journal, and The Financial Times, as well as many other pub publications. David is the co-author of a new book on the Middle East with Dennis Ross, who reportedly will be a key advisor in the Obama administration. Um, and David also teaches at the Middle East teaches Middle East studies at the Paul Nietzsche School of Advanced International Studies at Johns Hopkins University. Um, I would also like to thank our sponsors, Career, Service, Career Services Office, Middlebury Hillel, the Jewish Studies Program, the Middle East Studies Program, the Rohatan Center of International Affairs, as well as a big thank you to Martha Baldwin, Charlotte Tate, Ellen McKay, um, Allison Stanger, and of course, Iris Schiffer for their enormous help in organizing this event. And with no further ado, please join me in welcoming Mr. David Mikofsky. Thank you very much. Um, thank you very much. I hope you can hear me back there. Uh, it's wonderful for me to be here. I want to thank uh, all the sponsors who brought me, uh, also Professor Stanger, uh, Iris Schiffer, and uh, Maury, uh, who's been emailing me. I, um, you know, I've always wanted to come to Vermont, and uh, I only wish I could stay longer. Having just fractured my ankle, I guess my fear was that, oh my God, what if I slip on my ice? I just got my cast off yesterday, right before hopping on a plane. But uh, so far, so good. So if I sit down at different times, please don't take it as a sign of disrespect. Um, I, I've been briefed a little bit on, um, you know, on your efforts of dialogue, and I think it's wonderful. I think that's a great spirit. And I hope the, you know, the tone you'll hear from this talk is what I call more, more light, less heat. Um, we all want a, a solution to this uh, tragedy that has really gone on for, for too long and um, just, has just consumed so many people. Um, any solution that doesn't give dignity to all sides, by definition, won't be a solution. But the, this, the security dimension this is very complex. There have been a lot of complicating factors, as if you've been reading in the press. I just thought, while well, I'm here to talk about challenges to the Obama administration, needless to say, I, I am, you know, I might work with Dennis Ross, all the stuff you read is in the press about him. I certainly don't represent uh, any administration or anyone I represent, only myself. But um, my goal is to, to try to just talk about some of the challenges that the Obama administration faces. I think we have to begin with what's going on on the ground because that's where people's interest is as well. So we'll talk a little bit about Gaza, Syria, and Iran. I think three issues that are bound, um, I'd say Gaza slash West Bank, uh, those are three different uh, kind of regional hotspots that are bound to keep the focus of the Obama administration that has, it's full with other problems. Look at all the domestic, uh, uh, you know, horrific, uh, you know, recession going on at home. Look at the uh, fighting in Iraq, Afghanistan, Pakistan. There's no shortage of, of challenges, and you just wonder if there's enough space on the president-elect's desk to deal with them. Um, and I'm sure I'll have able assistance of uh, Secretary of State uh, designate Hillary Clinton and uh, uh, National Security Advisor Jim Jones and others. Um, it's Secretary of Defense uh, Bob Gates, too. Um, but let's start with Gaza, and I think it begins to behoove to, to give a little context of, you know, where does this come from? Where is this going? What are the policy options? And here I thought a map would be useful only because if you're not familiar with it, it's very hard to, um, you know, it's hard to understand how, what, what's happening and why is it happening. Look, is, uh, from where Israel's standing, they feel that Gaza is, should have been in the past, that they got out of Gaza in 2005. Uh, they pulled out 8,000 settlers. It was, uh, it was a source of major consternation uh, domestically. It led uh, Ariel Sharon to break up the Likud party that he founded in the 1970s uh, in order to do it, uh, that he was the first one to pull settlers out. Uh, the settlers and the others, many others of his critics said the Palestinians had done nothing to warrant Israel being pulled out. It should be reciprocal. Uh, Sharon Fali didn't have a partner. It was done, therefore, unilaterally. Some would argue that a Bush administration in 2005 that could have somehow utilized the fact that Israel wanted to get out of Gaza 
and that uh, Arafat had passed away from the scene, who had been a contentious figure, and that the President Abbas was now, who won a vote in 2005 with 62 percent of the vote, uh, based on a two-state solution and nonviolence, there should have been the, the basis for a peace process. I think that that moment in time was missed. And in some ways, we live in the shadow of 2005. Israel feels it, it felt it got out of Gaza, and that diplomats, the United Nations, everyone's been saying, if you only withdraw, if you don't be an occupier, then um, it's, it'll be land for peace. Israel will withdraw from the land, and it, instead will get peace. But what happened was um, that instead of that happening, um, there were a lot of rockets that were fired. And that intensified uh, really that next January, January 2006. Israel got out in August 2005 when Hamas, uh, you know, won an election. Uh, didn't win a majority, won a plurality, but it indeed did win. And then the rocket fire really intensified. And this has been going on uh, about 3,500 rockets uh, since Israel left. And the Israelis were puzzled. They said, I thought... If we got out, people wouldn't say, we're not occupiers, and there'd be peace. Instead, it's land for vulnerability. It's land for terror. Uh, I was joking with Secretary of State Rice. I, I met with her right before Annapolis. I said, they, the Israelis felt if they read the book in Gaza, they don't want to see the movie in the West Bank. And meaning that they, you know, they don't want a situation. What's happened with this rocket fire is it's, it's given those of us who want a two-state solution a bad name because people are saying, hey, I thought if there's no occupation, there won't be violence. Uh, but now, why would you get out of the West Bank? The whole of Israel will be covered by, these, by this rocket fire. Now, the Palestinian retort to this usually goes like this, which is, uh, well, you say you've gotten out, but, uh, you know, you've closed the crossings here at Kearney, Nachal Oz, and Erez. Um, there's a crossing in the south, but that's more Egypt. Then Israel, people think Israel still controls uh, the Carney, I mean the crossing down in the south, but it's Egypt that basically has not wanted to open it because they have feared an Islamist state on their frontier. So the, the net effect has been, let's see if we can get that down here, but um, the net effect has been, sorry about that, the net effect has been the Palestinians would say, well, you know, here, we would like, you know, to, you know, Israel's gotten out, but it, but we the co crossings are closed. This is the Rafa. That we're going to come back to this because this is a key. This is the I think the key part of the current war, even though there's hardly any fighting there. Um, the, so the Palestinians say Israel's out, but Israel um, doesn't, you know, um, you know we, you know we we want to show that we'll govern. But there's this international pressure on us, and it's not just the Americans and the Israelis, it's the fr Europeans. Uh, and it's the Russians and it's the UN, it's called the Quartet, US, Europe, Russia, UN, which says that if we Hamas want to engage, uh, we need to meet three conditions, disavow violence, you know, recognize Israel's existence, adhere to past agreements. And uh, Hamas has not wanted to do that and doesn't feel that it should do it. Um, because their complaint is not about really occupation, but it's really Israel's existence. They believe it's Muslim land, Israel shouldn't be anywhere. So they're not complaining why isn't uh, the West Bank, uh, is there a policy saying the West Bank? Their grievance is not what's called the 67 borders, the West Bank of Gaza, although I'm sure it's part of their grievance, but they say, and they give speeches over and over, it's, it's Israel's very existence. And this is... Um, and this has created the, the battlefield. Now, which, is, which has made things more complicated are, have been two developments. One is in 2007, um, Hamas said, look, we won this election, and we think the security services are too neutral, too pro Fatah. Fatah is the non-Hamas, that's the Palestinian Authority. Traditionally, that's been the mainstream party. And there was essentially a purge where... Uh, some might call it a coup, uh, to ensure that the, all the Fatah elements that were in the security services in Gaza are gone. So now it's, it's pretty much a pure Hamas state. Although the Palestinian Authority in the West Bank, because they don't want to be accused of being callous towards Palestinians, actually funds 
80,000 salaries in Gaza, which is ironic given the fact that Hamas denounces the Palestinian Authority every single day. And the Palestinian Authority quietly is urging Israel, and this is where you could say, wow, only in the Middle East, because this doesn't come across on television, basically wants Israel, in my view, to be tougher on Hamas. Once I think the, the military action to go after a lot of the leadership. And it's the same with the Egyptians. The Egyptians are, I think, in a certain bind that Egypt believes that, look, we, for us to have an Islamist state on our eastern frontier is, is a challenge to Egypt. Now, I want to be clear. Now, you know, those of you, when I say Islamist, doesn't mean Islam. It doesn't mean, uh, you know, state of Muslims. It means a, a, a state that is basically challenged a lot of the legitimacy of, of the existing Arab order. Uh, believes it should be based on the Sharia, Islamic law, etc. Um, in my view, that has been why you've had this very kind of, I don't know if the word is schizophrenic, but like split screen, I guess, uh, view of this war, that the Palestinians, that an Arab street that watches Al Jazeera, you know, Arab satellite television and other Arab channels, particularly Al Jazeera, which is the most popular, has had one view on the war, while uh, Egypt's leadership, led by President Hosni Mubarak, who's 80 years old, has had a different view. And his, his view is, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not going to open the Rafah crossing point, no matter what Hamas says. Which you would say, wait a second, I thought it was Israel against the Arabs. So now you're telling me, David, it's Israel, the Palestinian Authority, and Egypt against Hamas. It's a different frame for this issue, but in my view, it's, it's more accurate because the regime and the public see it very differently in Egypt. If you're a public, you can see it like others see it. I'm watching television, so I'm going to look at the human dimension. If you're a regime, if you're the, you know, Egypt, you're going to say, wait a second, uh, in a Hamas that's emboldened in Gaza is a Hamas that essentially could spill over into Egypt. Uh, there have been uh, hotels that have been blown up in the Sinai, which have done by Al-Qaeda. Al-Qaeda is not Hamas. Hamas does, does not see itself as Al-Qaeda. Uh, they see themselves as focused on, you know, this particular area of the Palestinian-Israel struggle. But uh, we do think some of the explosives have gone the other way, and there's been some training, and there's been some you know, giving over to some elements, and there have been hotels that have blown up on, on Egyptian soil in the Sinai Desert. Uh, it's been a popular tourist resort. But I think the broader fear of Egypt is that it will link up with the Muslim Brotherhood. That is a political group which was formed back in 1929, I believe, and which you know, was not allowed to you know, to uh, operate unofficially on one level, but operates unofficially. And for Egypt, it's created certain tensions because um, it doesn't want to be seen as heavy-handed towards Hamas in a way because those that'll blow back into Egypt and it could inflame the Muslim Brotherhood. At the same time, it doesn't want to strengthen Hamas <laughs> because it might make common alliance with this same Muslim Brotherhood at the expense of Egypt. Uh, the Egyptian government. So Egypt has is, is, is tried to tread a very careful tightrope on how it deals with this issue. And its main position, though, ultimately, I think is pretty much like Israel's, which is if you open up the crossing points, uh, the Rafah crossing point, it should go to the Palestinian Authority, to the people in the West Bank. They should be the ones there and they should be in control, and they should emerge from this as being the victor. And, and, that is, uh, and, and Mubarak has carried this policy approach throughout this crisis, despite uh, demonstrations inside Egypt and at Egyptian embassies in different parts of the Middle East. So, therefore, in the Middle East, things are not always the way they seem on the surface. It's more complicated. Now, the, this round of fighting blew up, in my view, because you had this situation where uh, there was um, what they call a tahadiyah in Arabic, a lull, a ceasefire, um, if you will, for six months that started this summer. I think Ehud Barak, the um, defense minister of Israel, 
who, um, you know, saw better a ceasefire because Israel would prefer not to go into Gaza. Uh, Gaza, just if you look at the topography, was different than the West Bank. When Israel went into the West Bank during the second intifada, the second uprising between 2000 and 2004, its ability to take the cities in the West Bank was a function of the road system, where you could basically encircle a city by grabbing the access roads and, and, and putting pressure that way. The way that it's set up in Gaza is, is a lot of urban sprawl. And needless to say, with the Intifada, and like there's been economic uh, dislocation and, and, and certainly uh, economic, uh, you know, a very s profound economic problems. I don't want to sugarcoat this at all. But uh, the Israeli view has always been towards the Gazans, hey Hamas, it's up to you. You know, you, you could end this tomorrow morning. Just say, sit, agree to accept Israel and, and, and let's move on. We'll sit with you, et cetera. Hamas has said no. The way they, what, what Barak and, and, and through the Egyptians reached a ceasefire, a tahadia, in the summer and said, look, you're bombing right now, stay wrote. And, and some of the, the surrounding Israeli villages, even going up to Ashkelon, which is only a few miles up the road. You can't really see it here. It's about, you know, just like 10 miles uh, from the border, less probably. And, um, you know, Israel said, look, you fired 8,500 rockets uh, and mortars in Israel all these years. The world didn't have a, you know, a UN uh, Security Council meeting while that was going on. Now, it started just hitting Stay Road, but then the range grew further. And for six months, the ceasefire, though, for the most part, held. But then... Hamas, I don't think it was ever written it was going to be December 19th. I think it was, it was kind of open-ended. Hamas said, no, after six months it stops. And then when it was over, Israel said, well, let's keep it going. Uh, I think, to be fair to Hamas, I would say they might have wanted it too, but they felt that if they would do some military, you know, fire some attacks on Israel, maybe they could change the terms of the ceasefire more to their liking. And they wanted to open up Rafah, uh, in particular, they don't they don't speak ever of opening up Carney and Nachal Oz. By the way, Carney is the key one because that's where goods cross. But I think for them to say that means they want economic uh, trade with Israel, and they don't want to say that Israel even exists. So they make the focus on Rafa, even though Rafa there actually is no goods. It's actually a crossing point for individuals, um, and uh, and they fire two hundred more rockets or so. Now the problem is these rockets also have gotten greater range. And, and, and that brings us back to the south, because even though the firing of the rockets largely came from the Beit Hanun, Beit Lachia, and this area, the northern part of Gaza, um, the origin, some of the rockets, what they call the Qasims, are home, homegrown, it is true, uh, but a lot of the explosives, is my understanding, comes through these tunnels. And the Grad rockets, the, the new versions that can hit Beersheba, um, and now have hit Gedera, 20 miles south of Tel Aviv. Tel Aviv is Israel's biggest city. Some of you may have heard of it. Beersheba. There's now a million Israelis come within the range of rocket fire. Um, for Israel, it's a belief of saying, hey, you know, if Hamas wouldn't fire, Israel wouldn't fire. Israel's not out to pick a fight. But on the other hand, if this was the United States and where people were firing from Montreal or much closer distances into Vermont, um, you know, we would have a problem with that, and the United States probably would not let it go on uh, the way Israel has. Um, I think the key to ending this thing is this area. It's called the Philadelphia Road. Some people say, why Philadelphia? It sounds like Philadelphia. Yes, it is. It's, it started on, a, on the military map of the IDF. That's how it was called on their computer program, apparently. Um, and basically, in my view, this war is going to end when they figure out a way to stabilize this border area. Because the tunnels have come in through this area. This is the northern Sinai. You can't see it. The Sinai Desert goes all the way down. And then Egypt goes all the way across. But the smuggling goes here. The smugg Israel is not allowed. There's no smuggling coming from within Israel into Gaza to fire back at Israel. It's all coming through Egypt. And the Grads and, and those rockets that have brought these a million Israelis within the rocket, the range of these more potent rockets, uh, is, is there. Now, 
that has led people to say, well, let me get this straight, David. You just said that the regime has an interest in containing Hamas in Egypt. So why aren't they more effective? That's a very good question. <laughs> and we haven't heard good answers on that. Uh, Mubarak uh, has said, yes, yes, yes. We're going to do more. Um, they modified the terms of the Egypt-Israel Peace Treaty to upgrade the quality of Egyptian personnel to fight this, this thing. But this, what's happened is because, you could say, because of the closing of the other crossing points, and, and there's a Palestinian, there's an Egyptian side to Rafah too, that this has become a lucrative trade. They don't just trade in rockets, they trade in cigarettes and 20 million other things. And now Hamas actually has so regularized the, 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 the smuggling routes that they take taxes on the, on the tunnels. I think there's insurance on the tunnels. There's all sorts of things. It's become an industry. And people say, well, look, if you had a situation where the PA or someone was, the Palestinian Authority was in charge here, wouldn't Israel want to open up more crossing points with Egypt here, there? And I would say, yes, absolutely. If they felt they had a partner, they would definitely open up the, the, the trade. And that would, in my view, a lot of the smuggling of, of the tunnels is commercial. Uh, it's not just about the military side. It's about, um, you know, the commercial side. And they've been paying off, basically, Egyptian police people to kind of turn the other eye. Israel claims there's 400 tunnels in this area here, which is only nine miles long. I don't know how they, they count exactly. There might be exit and entry points uh, with single shafts. I mean, I, I don't want to, I don't think it's important to get out to the, the, the exact number of the tunnels. But the point is, this is the area. If they could solve this area, uh, I think this, this war will come to an end uh, to bring stability. Uh, because without rockets coming in, then, then the issue of Hamas is not the same potent problem. Now, you can say, well, don't they? Hamas has a supply. The truth is the number of rockets Hamas is firing now is dropping. I think because of Israeli military pressure from 70 a day, it's down to about 20 a day, uh, I think, as of yesterday. But the point here is that you're looking for a solution where you stop the smuggling. I like sports, so I'll have to use a sport metaphor. In football, you know, you don't just try to intercept the ball near the goal line. You want to intercept the ball downfield. So a lot of the focus on security arrangements with the Egyptians is going to be on how to stop the rockets much farther uh, deep into the Sinai. There's only a few main roads of the Sinai, uh, and, and therefore there's a sense if you could patrol those roads better, you might be able to stop this, this smuggling. Where the diplomacy is now is to try to have, the, there's, Egypt is trying to mediate this. Uh, Hamas has got a three-member delegation in Cairo. What we sense is that the local Hamas chapter, or whatever you want to call it, in um, their leadership in Gaza wants to end this and will agree to any terms. But the people sitting in Damascus who are, like to call the shots uh, so the others could fire them, uh, you know, uh, their view, because they're not bearing any of the brunt of this, their view is, no, hang tough, you guys should be tougher. So there seems to be a split within Hamas now. We're not exactly sure. And, but I think there's also an effort to see what the Egyptians can do to maybe um, get some expertise. Uh, it's a very sensitive to Egypt's national pride. They don't want to have fo international forces, even though that's all over the media. But I think that is an issue where Egypt thinks it's a dilution of their sovereignty. But could there be, uh, you know, assistance um, you know, it's been in the press that the United States gave $23 million to the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers to deal with technology to help detect tunnels. Are there things else that could be done uh, to help the Egyptians? So I think the mediation will go based on this. I wonder if also Hosni Mubarak, who's had a very kind of rough relationship with this President Bush, uh, he had a good relationship with his father, actually, but not with this president, is he waiting out this administration and saying, okay, I sign, I'll, I'll do all this, but I'm only going to give it to President Obama because he's the one I'm going to work with for the next four years. So there could be a timing question, but I think for the most part, the goal is that Egypt takes a stronger role and that the PA returns to this area. If the Egyptian mediation fails, I think we're going to see a new ground war right here uh, in the next week uh, because... 
this is where Israel will say, well, if there's no Egypt, someone's got to do it. Uh, and it doesn't believe international troops will do it. Now, why not? Well, because in the Arab-Israeli context, Middle East, when people say international troops, it sounds very official. But in truth, they tend to be more monitors than they are peace enforcers. Uh, it's not a Kosovo-like situation. Like in, in, in Lebanon, the, the force does not you know, monitors Hezbollah. You could say, well, it constrains Hezbollah from, from attacking like it did in 2006, but it doesn't, you know, go after weapon supplies or anything like that. Where the international monitors have been successful is where the parties themselves want success. In other words, you have a thing in the Sinai called the MFO, the Multinational Force, uh, which is uh, led by the United States. But all they're there is to monitor that Egypt is not about to start a war um, with Israel. Well, Egypt and Israel are at peace. So the odds, you know, Mubarak and the Israelis don't want to go to war. So the MFO is a great success because there's nothing to monitor, really, because there's no Egyptian tanks about to rumble through the Sinai and attack Israel. Same with the Golan Heights with Syria and Israel. The Syrians give weaponry to Hezbollah to attack Israel through Lebanon. But the Golan border, they're very careful with. Basically, monitors work where the two sides have reached a political decision not to engage. But a force that is interposed between combatants is a very different kettle of fish. And that no one wants to be in the middle of. I went to NATO and met with some of the people there. And they looked at me saying, well, maybe we'd send people after the conflict is over and they've already solved Jerusalem. I said, great, then they might not need you, you know. <laughs> you know, what's the big deal? You know, and, but they're busy with Afghanistan, so they don't have time. So, uh, or the interest, or they don't know one wants to be stuck between Israel and Hamas. So I think that the monitor idea is limited value. Egypt is a country that has a, has a significant military, and if there's a way to bolster capability, I think that will make the difference. But, Mike, and if the Egyptian thing roots, works, which I think we're all rooting for, then I think the PA would return here. They would, op they would open the crossing point, and then the PA would have a foothold back in, in Gaza. Now, if they don't, I think Israel's going to stage a ground operation. Um, you know, I think within a week, although some of you can write me and say it was 10 days, not a week. I mean, but the point is, is that I think that's where it's heading. Um, Israel will say, look, this is all about the tunnels. That's, that's the real story of this war. And Israel cannot be in a situation that its big cities are under attack, especially after it left the area, or that it has to close down its only international airport because, uh, you know, uh, Continental, uh, Air France, uh, British Airways, nobody, Swiss Air, no one's going to want to go, you know, into an airport which is within the range of rocket fire. So Israel sees this as a, as a life or death uh, thing for it. So I don't think they're about to give up. Um, and I think they will not take the international condemnation seriously because they will think it lacks moral standing. Where were the, you know, all the condemnations when Israel was hit it, getting hit with these rockets? So I think that, therefore, I don't think the UN is going to solve this problem. Now, the, Hamas, for its view, is to say is, Whatever the solution is, it should open up the crossing points because we have gone through economic dislocation, which has been profound. Um, and um, and uh, I think people are looking for ways to help the Palestinians without helping Hamas. And that's where it comes down to. Now, maybe the opening up here under the PA will be good. Um, I can't predict it. But I think these are the two main options that are under discussion. I think most of us would like to see tragedy end, would hope the first option works. And there's a lot of flurry of back and forth. I think the, the lack of administration, though, at this time, the fact that there's nobody home in Washington in a certain way is, is, is not helpful because an administration that wanted to kind of shepherd the diplomacy could, uh, you know, there was someone home, could really uh, help, you know, lead this to a new phase. But, you know, with one administration has one foot out the door, the other one not yet in the door, it, it makes things harder. So that's where we are on Gaza. Uh, I'm happy to entertain questions later on it, but let me just, because I have limited time, just go to the two other areas that I think, you know, I'll just say actually about the West Bank. Let me say about that, too, before we, um, 
talk about um, the other part, and that is the question is to what extent can you see a situation where an Obama administration is able to, oops, see here, you know, will, you know, will there be, you know, can they find a way to solve the West Bank? I think the irony is that, um, that there is a way to, um, I don't want to bother you with all the land stuff, I'm afraid I'll get you all, comp you know, I've, I don't want to, you know, confuse you some more. But I would say the following, that, you, you know, you've got a situation that the, um, that actually the, the differences over land between Israel and the Palestinians and the West Bank are very narrow. I realize it's hard for people to swallow because they're so used to hearing bad news out of the Middle East that if you tell them any good news, you feel like you've ruined their day because they're so conditioned to bad news. So with respect to former President Carter, who I respect for his efforts to make Middle East peace in the 1970s and don't think a treaty could have been done without President Carter, I think he misses it on this one because I think this thing isn't about a land loss. Israel would like to give away the land and end this thing. They just don't want to get blown up. Uh, it gets back to my comment to Secretary Rice about, um, you know, if you didn't like the book, why would you see the movie? Uh, there's a jadedness that peace is possible. And it started from the Intifada in 2000 all the way to now. And the Palestinians don't believe it either because they don't see their daily lives improving. So here you've got this situation What's missing is what I would call a regional and a societal context for peacemaking. You've got to get the publics into the game, out of the playing field, off, out of the grandstands, onto the playing field, and get them to believe again. Because if they don't believe, the leaders are not going to be able, there will be no political capital to expend in making the critical decisions. Um, I think that's important the publics believe. How do you get people to believe again? They have to see their lives getting better. Um, this cannot just be an abstraction. It has to be real. Um, I think there's ways to improve the Palestinian economic life, in my view, without hurting Israeli security. Technology today means things like, this may sound very boring and banal, I'll just say this very quickly, but there are things that you could do today. The U.S. Customs Service is able to seal containers. Um, Israel's worried that, that people will put bombs in containers. So if it goes, it'll blow up at the Haifa port or Ashdod port where there's exports. There's ways now to do this technologically to seal it uh, with, and GPS systems and all sorts of things so the Palestinians can have, get their goods to export and the Israelis don't have to feel they're about to get blown up. Uh, biometrics, you could deal with things at crossing points. Um, but it's, it's also getting um, the Arabs to help out economically. Uh, Gulf Arabs, it's true oil isn't $150 a barrel, but there's still a lot of money in the Gulf. Uh, the Gulf states can make a difference. Uh, they've given uh, a housing project to UAE, the United Arab Emirates, and Gaza. Uh, imagine if you had 10 housing projects that would uh, give jobs to people. Yes, the Palestinian economy is improving. There was an article in the New York Times recently of the efforts of Salam Fayyad, the Palestinian Prime Minister, this isn't the Arafat era anymore, who saw himself as a revolutionary. Fayyad got a PhD from the University of Texas, worked at the International Monetary Fund for 14 years. And Israelis will say this is the first serious Palestinian leadership they've encountered because they see there's a leadership that wants to build up Palestine more than tear down Israel. They didn't feel that with Arafat. So in my view, there's some hope here. But there has to be a context, in my view, where the Arab states to help these weak, a weak state like the uh, authority, like the Palestinian Authority, and give it political cover. That means delegitimize Hamas and say your rockets are not bringing you closer to a two-state solution. They're bringing you farther and farther away. Um, they, they need to provide that cover that they're not providing. And Israel has to do things economically, in my view, that do not come at the expense of its security. And the Palestinians that now have a technocratic education minister and things like that, um, they can now also do what I would call is, uh, an a new educational uh, curriculum for coexistence. The Israelis, I think, would be a partner in this. Because the Israeli public, whenever you talk to them about all these peace plan ideas, they go, oh, this is all very lovely, but what are they teaching their kids? 
Are they teaching them that, that there's a moral legitimacy to, for Israel, uh, that there's a hope for coexistence? If you're perpetuating hate to the next generation, there's no chance. So what are their textbooks like? And then the Palestinians will say, well, what about, well, don't just pick on us. What about the Israeli books? The Israelis said, oh, we, we, you know, we'll put the Palestinians on a map. You can go back and forth. The point is you need a framework. So I think you need a societal context. You need a regional context to provide cover uh, that provides a sense of legitimacy uh, to make these concessions. If you have these two sets of contexts, and these are not sequential, I want to be clear. It's not saying until you've checked every textbook, you can't start peace. You'll never get there, obviously. But they could run in parallel. But you need to get the publics engaged. They've been in the, in the grandstands too long. They're so jaded that I would say that the Jewish settlers didn't even argue uh, demonstrating, didn't even bother demonstrating against the government that was against them because they felt that it was too abstract, that this wasn't going to happen anyway, so why waste a demonstration? That shows you how cynical people have gotten. And this age of cynicism, I think, mm -hmm. means it's very hard for political leaders to take position. I think an Obama administration could bring some new hope, a new sense of, of direction and energy that would get people to believe that the United States is, is back in the game and is trying to work with Israel and the Palestinian Authority uh, to make peace possible. Now, can they do the grand deal with uh, the land, um, refugees, Jerusalem, and security? I think that's the big question. I said, ironically, on the land issue, they're very, the differences are virtually non-existent. The issue is more on the security dimension that the Israelis believe if, if the PA isn't ready to take over security, then the rockets are everywhere, and it's Gaza times 20. Uh, and that's the Israeli nightmare. So there might be a way with an authority that is not um, you know, like Hamas. The United States is trying to, to staff up. Uh, there's three-star general Keith Dayton, who's now trained 1,000 Palestinian security forces in Jordan. Uh, to, to come in, these are Palestinians, to help take over different cities, and they're working with Israel. Um, and, you know, finally, after all these lean years, so to speak, the security cooperation is starting to come back in the West Bank. Um, some say the real story here is that the PA and Israel have a strategic alliance against Hamas because for their own reasons, neither wants Hamas. Israel sees Hamas as sworn Israel's destruction. And the Palestinian Authority, which is more secular, sees Hamas as wanting to bring them back to the 12th century, in their view. And so they are working together to keep Hamas out. And uh, Fayyad is great in, in, in terms of raising living standards, and Israel is doing some of the behind-the-scenes security work. Uh, but more and more, the Palestinians are starting to do more in the security dimension as well. The refugees in Jerusalem are issues of self-definition for these parties. And it won't be easy to solve. But I think an American administration will at least try to see if it's possible to bridge these gaps. I would say at minimal, you should try to work on solving the land issue because the differences are virtually non-existent. And most of the settlers live adjacent to the pre-67. That was when that war was, uh, the pre-67 war when the land was taken. Um, but at the same time, um, you could, what they call, I don't want to bore you with all these details, but you could swap for the land. In other words, if 4% of, 4.4% uh, of the land is where most of the settlers live, 75% of them, then compensate the Palestinians with good quality land, and there is that quality land, uh, for another 4.4% elsewhere within Israel. And I think the land issue is ripe. And uh, the security issue Jerusalem and refugees is still subject to question, but at least we're in the right direction on security with the training of the Palestinian Authority forces. Now, where does that leave us with issues not related to the Palestinians? Uh, I would just say very quickly, because um, we don't have time, um, we got two, two, um, two areas I would look at. I think the sleeper issue uh, for 2009, if you want to ask me, okay, tell me something that I'm not going to, you know, that I don't, that's going to surprise me the most on the Middle East for the better. Again, I hope I don't ruin anyone's day. Uh, I think it's Syria. I think in a weird way, while the Syria issue is very much under the radar screen, I think that the Israelis and the Syrians very much uh, could have common ground. How do I know this? Because they are already meeting indirectly in Turkey. 
uh, they've had four rounds, and they have common interests. And here's what will surprise you. Who are the biggest proponents in Israel for um, peace with Syria? Uh, is the, the Israeli military, Echelon, because they see themselves as pragmatists, and in their view, this could lead to a strategic realignment of the West Bank, the way that Henry Kissinger did with Egypt when he brought them away from the Soviets in the 1970s. I've met with Syrians. There's a feeling of dissatisfaction that for their, all their relations with Iran, that they have not been able to improve economically. Their economy keeps shrinking. They're now importing more oil than they're exporting. And they believe, as they've told me, our ticket is peace. If we could do peace with Israel, people will invest in this country. We won't be a pariah state. There'll be hope. So I think economics, which I think is key in the Palestinian context, is key in this context, too, to try to find a way to, um, to we, what I would call break the link with Syria, uh, Iran, and Hezbollah. Uh, that has been the access. But of the three, and, and Hamas is actually in that group, too, of, the, of those four, the only one that's not what I would, call, what I would say is a secular entity are the Alawites in Syria. And I think they've been sending signals. They're willing to, to break that chain and to, to move in a direction that's not just a favor to America, but a favor to themselves economically. And here's the surprise, a favor also to the Arabs, because Syria has been marginalized by Arab states because of their relationship with Iran. Uh, maybe people here in this country think all the Muslims are this, together and the same. It's not exactly the way it is in the Middle East. There's, there's been historic enmity between the Persians and the Arabs. And the Arabs have felt that the Syrians have been the, the, the strategic partner of Iran. And therefore, if you could bring Syria away from Iran, you will be returning them to the Arab fold as well. So I think that's the, the, the one to look for. I wouldn't go so far as to call it low-hanging fruit. I don't believe in that phrase. Others have used it in, in other contexts. I don't believe in it. I think it's going to be a very hard negotiation. But I think there's a lot of promise because, to me, if people do things for self-interest, it's the most sustainable uh, way to do it over time. And I think Syria sees that peace is, is going to be in its interest. Um, and, and Israel would love to get them away from that axis. So that's where I think is the key. The, the last piece, and I'm, I'm, I'm talking too long, so I'm going to, um, you know, just have to say a few sentences. I just, the Gaza issue I thought was hot, and therefore I devoted a lot of time to that. But Iran, there, um, I think uh, the Obama administration and uh, the president-elect has made the idea of negotiating with Iran a kind of uh, a key element of its, of its foreign policy. And, and I think he said in a recent interview, this has to be soon, because um, by September it is expected that Iran will have enough low enriched uranium uh, to be able to, uh, by September, throw out the inspectors and, and convert that uh, uranium into enough weapons grade, highly enriched uranium for a nuclear bomb within six to 12 months. So right now there are what they call IAEA inspectors, International Atomic Energy Agency inspectors. But if they throw them out, then there's no inspectors. So I, I tend to believe between now and September, you're going to see a real effort by an Obama administration to see, could you make a grand bargain with Iran? I think it's going to be based on what I call big carrots and big sticks. Big carrots, meaning if Iran is willing to move away from the nukes, that there'll be ways to try to integrate Iran more with the West. But if Iran doesn't want to go forward, I think the sanctions will, will ratchet up. Israel, uh, we probably read in the New York Times uh, on Sunday, you know, wanted to at one point bomb Iran. The Pentagon dissuaded Israel from doing so and did not provide Israel with the machinery it, it needed to do so. And Israel is not going to be wanting to be seen uh, in, in practice or in, in, in theory to obstruct these talks. Uh, Israel's no problem with the U.S. meeting with Iran, but would like to see the results. Uh, and this is not about Israel or the United States. It's about, I think, Iran with a nuclear weapon means a new Middle East in the worst sense. It means an arms race. Egypt will want a bomb. If there's a Persian Shiite bomb, they'll, be, they'll want a Sunni Arab bomb. And the Saudis with the relations with uh, Pakistan, Turkey, which is not Arab, but it's in the neighborhood, will also want it. 
There could be greater proliferation to non-state actors like Hezbollah or Hamas wanting a dirty bomb. Uh, there are a lot of consequences here. It could change the calculus of third parties who are now say, well, Iran is the rising superpower of the Middle East. All we got is oil. You know, let's kind of go with the flow. And, uh, you know, and they start thinking differently. Or certain rejectionists feel emboldened because they feel they might have a nuclear umbrella of Iran. It changes everybody's thinking. And it, I think it, it will mean you'll have the most, uh, you know, the, the one region with the most conflicts will be um, now everyone will have nukes. So I think it's very dangerous. And therefore, I pray that diplomacy is successful. And I just think if you look at Gaza, the West Bank, Syria, uh, you know, and Iran, uh, there's a lot for a new administration just to focus on these issues. I'm not even talking about Iraq, Afghanistan, Pakistan. Uh, there's a lot of, 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 of negotiations uh, and, and tough times ahead. And let's all pray that President Obama has both the, you know, the wisdom and, and how, to, how to navigate this period and find the way to help make for a more peaceful Middle East. Thank you all very much. <laughs> Questions? Questions? Yes, sir. Well, that's why I hope this Egyptian mediation works, because I think the key is to stabilize the tunnel area. And if you could stabilize that border area, then in my view, you know, Israel is not going to need, if Hamas doesn't have the rockets, it's not going to be able to fire them, and Israel's not going to be retaliating. I think the Israelis would say, look, a lot of these 8,000 rockets and mortars fell on Israel, and Israel hardly responded. It wasn't disproportionate, or maybe disproportionate the opposite way that they didn't respond, but no one cared. Uh, what are they supposed to do? And uh, well, their citizens are, are being attacked. So I think part of trying to stabilize things is to look the diplomatic, the peaceful way. And I think if, if you could get the Egyptians to undertake more responsibility there, you could improve the West Bank situation. Um, I think the key is the. I think the issue isn't the land. Israel's not out to expand or grab. Uh, I think the core is, is to find a way that you don't let the rejectionists have a veto uh, over, over peace. And if you have a partner with the PA, I think that's, that's the best hope uh, that has the security strength on its own to deal with its own internal problems. The problems have been is that Hamas has exploited the weakness of the Palestinian Authority and that Israel is saying, well, nobody's home. What should be done? Uh, but Israel has to act in its self-defense. It can't let its citizens getting blown up. And I don't think people would, would, would question that. So I'm hoping that diplomacy is, is going to be the way forward um, to, to work to stabilize the Gaza border, to stabilize the West Bank, to train the Palestinian security. And, and also, if you can get the Syrians out of, the, out of the, the, you know, that access, you will weaken that rejectionist group. So I think diplomacy is definitely the watchword. And um, I, I don't think it's about using the military for uh, territorial expansion, as I see it. Yes, sir. Really will damage them enough, or do you think it will only end up strengthening? 
It's a very fair question. Um, I think uh, there's no doubt that, hum that Hezbollah won sympathy for fighting Israel to an inconclusive draw. I mean, let's be clear, though, how they did it. They fired indiscriminately, embedded within civilian areas, against Israeli civilians, but counted that Israel wouldn't do the same uh, because of Israel's uh, being a, a more Western country. Um, and so they, you know, they punched below the belt, and they, they assumed Israel could only punch above the belt. Now, I'm not saying that Israel always did, but I think that was the effort. Um, and the Israeli army basically came out of that Hezbollah war and said, never again. You know, this is not going to happen again, uh, where they will gain all this support by being seen as, as the underdog, having fought that. Now, their training, I think, partly was off in 2006 because Israel was, the army was not doing military training. They were, you know, defending buses, discotheques, and pizzerias because a thousand bomb, uh, over a hundred suicide bombers blew up Israeli urban areas. It's the new nature of warfare in the Middle East, frankly, is this asymmetrical warfare. It's not like the old days of 48 to 73. In 1948 to 73, you know, you fought Arab armies in deserts. Here, it's all about the urban areas, blowing up women, children, etc. And the Israeli army was diverted. It didn't train. Now Israel set up an, an urban warfare center and trained for this much better. I, I think it's a different warfare. I, I come back to Egypt because one of the differences is while Iran and Syria inflamed that arena in Hezbollah, they had no interest in stopping it. Egypt does. Uh, and therefore, and Hamas aspires to be Hezbollah, but are, don't yet have the capabilities. But um, So you could do things with Egypt that you can't do. But your, but your question is also to the question of to what extent does an attack create sympathy in, among the Arab street. And I think it does. I think, you know, your point is fair. Um, let's be clear, though, that how they did it and the fact that they got this international assistance from Iran in getting to that point. Um, therefore, in my view, there's a diminishing returns element here um, where you start off by having the Arab regimes and the United States and Israel all together, but there's going to be some misfire of a rocket uh, and, and you know, then the television pictures, and ultimately it's going to change the dynamics of the effort. So I think I would hope the Hezbollah thing says it's got to be shorter contact. That's why I hope this Egypt issue is wrapped up this week, because I do see the diminishing returns dimension. The Israeli public will come back to it and say, look, sympathy is important, but if the rockets are being smuggled in against the cities, what is a country to do? Um, you know, it's, it's a very difficult situation. Hamas was losing popularity until this war, but let's be clear. One of the reasons why it was losing popularity in this war was because Egypt, and, you know, closed off its, its crossings and Israel had its crossing points and the public was saying, hey, Hamas, you're supposed to improve our standard of living and you're not doing that. So let's be clear why Hamas was not doing well before the war. How it does after the war will be a, an outgrowth of how this war ends. And I am concerned that if option two happens, I mean, option one was an Egypt option, but if option two is Israel goes to the Philadelphia Road, and then you're going to be in urban areas in Rafa, you know, that's going to create a whole new set of pictures that are not going to be sympathetic. It's not just the pictures, obviously. No one wants a single person to die, period. Uh, but the point here is that I don't know if option one is going to work. And I fear option two. Uh, I fear, though, that's the next step because the Israelis believe they have, n they have no choices because no one else cares if Israelis live or die. So they feel they they they're in a corner. Um, but um, let's hope that the mediation works. And, and you point to a fair, a very uh, fair, uh, you know, a very fair point. But let's see how this this conflict ends. Yes, sir, right here. No, no. Okay, all good questions. Um, I would say on the first part of the, the election uh, dimension, um, 
you know, here it's interesting that the Palestinian Authority president, Mahmoud Abbas, he was the, him and the Egyptians were the first one who said, you know, you know, Hamas, if you went to start firing rockets, we wouldn't be in this mess. Uh, that, that wasn't an Israeli talking. This was a Palestinian and an Egyptian talking. And they didn't feel the fact that someone was elected gave them immunity to, to start firing rockets against another country. Um, so, and also, frankly, I think, you know, although this wasn't your question, and I realize what I'm about to say, you know, many of you may disagree, but I would argue that, you know, people say, why don't we give more donor assistance? They were elected. You know, the fact is that the donor program to assist the Palestinians was based on how do you invest in coexistence. The Hamas view is, give us your money. <laughs> Don't t preach to us about coexistence. And so the international community, this is not just America, uh, this is Europe, Russia, the UN, have said, listen, we'll change our attitude towards you if you change your attitude towards Israel. This is not just an American perspective. The quartet has held the line. I know there's a lot of people who are skeptical of the Europeans, but the Europeans have, have actually held very closely with the United States on this. So I tend to think that the people that have called Hamas on the carpet, so to speak, are A, the Palestinians themselves, uh, Mahmoud Abbas, and the Egyptians, and, um, and that the, the international bar of legitimacy, in my view, is not just being demanded by America, but it's being demanded by all the quartet partners. But there's no doubt that, in terms of television uh, pictures, once you leave the United States, people keep saying, well, if Israel would only not occupy, you know, there wouldn't be this problem, and they, you gravitate to the human suffering. And I admit, I keep coming back to the same point, and I'll say it 100,000 times. Any solution that doesn't give dignity to both isn't going to work. So you want a solution that Palestinians have that dignity, no less than Israel. Um, but at the same time, you can't tell the Israelis, you pull out, and at the same time, uh, you know, uh, you're going to be under rocket fire. And that's the piece that people don't seem to connect. And I think that's the missing piece, um, to paraphrase Dennis Ross's book, his first book. So I, I'm not here to say that, uh, you know, that they're, they're not differences. But, there, but in terms of the quartet, the Euros have, have been insisting on Hamas no less than the United States. So maybe there's a gap here, too, between publics and governments, not just in the Arab world. It was a woman right here. Yeah. I think the talks will be about everything. Uh, I think the key will be the nukes, because there's a ticking clock, literally. Uh, but um, I think it'll be everything, and I don't think it'll wait till the Ahmadinejad election in June. People say, don't negotiate with him now. Don't you understand he's going to use this in his election commercials, uh, saying, oh, America is crawling on its knees to Iran. Ahmadinejad was right in being so defiant. And I realize that's part of the collateral damage, so to speak. But given that this, you've got this September deadline, you can't really wait, and, and, and therefore, there is a danger that Ahmadinejad will use it. To, he's the guy who wants, says, oh, wipe Israel off the face of the map, and he denies the Holocaust. Now, Khomeini also called for wiping Israel off the face of the map, but he wasn't developing nuclear weapons. It's the convergence of both the will and the responsibility and the, and the capability. To be fair, though, he's not what we would call the decider, in the words of President Bush. The Ayatollah Khamenei is the decider. He's the supreme leader. But Ahmadinejad is part of the mix, and there's no doubt that one of the downsides of doing this now is it could bolster him come the June elections. But I expect that, that negotiation to go on across the board. And President-elect Obama's point on this is to say, look, not to talk to them, you know, it didn't work for eight years. Uh, look, they're, all, they're on the verge of having a nuclear cap capability. We've got to do something, we've got to change. So I think that's, that's what's driving the United States. There's no guarantee it's going to work. I would call it, uh, and Dennis Ross and I in, in, um, in our book call it engagement without illusions. It could be it won't work. But if you tried it and it didn't work, it will frame your other policy options differently. You know, you will, you'll be able to use some other if it's sanctions or force, whatever maybe you want to just say deterrence. All this will seem much more credible making sure you're saying America is not the issue. We sat with them. They, you know, just didn't work. 
But I think there's going to be, I don't think it's a pro forma effort at all. I think it's a genuine effort to try to, to reach some understandings across the board with Iran, albeit it could be in a short period, and I, I, don't, I can't guarantee success. Yes, woman over here. Yes, ma'am. Right. Look, I don't see myself as an expert on the Muslim brother in Egypt, but I would say that I share your concern. Um, you know, if you want Islamist participation in politics, there has to be a way that they can be do it legitimately. And if they don't have a way to do it legitimately, you know, then violence is going to be used. You see, what, what separates, it seems to me, and I'm, again, I'm not an expert on the Muslim Brotherhood, but what separates them from Hezbollah and Hamas, in my view, is, is the use of, of weaponry. Because once you, um, you know, use your weapons, it seems to me, you don't want to choose between ballots and bullets. You want to have it both ways. Um, in my view, what you're really saying is I want to be able to opt out whenever I want, on my terms. And this is a particularly potent threat when you're dealing with such weak states as the Palestinian Authority and Lebanon. Egypt is a strong state. It's been a unitary state, as far as I can see, a strong state, you know, going back to the pharaohs. Um, and therefore, it should not feel the same threat. While Hamas can do whatever it wants, Hezbollah does whatever it wants, and it can basically uh, impose its will on these states because of their ability to do both. That's why I think it was such a tragedy with, someone asked me about elections, you know, in 2006, we in the United States should have said, here, there's an Oslo agreement, the Palestinian Authority signed it, Israel signed it, and basically it says you can't go to the, uh, uh, an election with a militia. I mean, imagine this country, Howard Dean has a, a Democratic National Committee militia, a Republican National Committee militia, and they've got thousands of guns and rockets and firing at each other. I mean, and, this, and we're the United States, and we wouldn't allow that. So it seems to me that, um, you know, I know I realize Howard Dean's from Vermont, so despite the, the, the sympathy for Howard Dean, I still think if he had a militia, it would be a very different situation. I'm sure he's a very wonderful person, I have no doubt. But I'm just using that as a metaphor, not in an actual sense. But my point is, when you allow Hezbollah and Hamas to basically determine the rules of the game, which they do by clinging to their militias, then, then you don't have a democratic polity, it seems to me. And that's where I thought the Bush administration fell down. I, it seems to me, and I, I, I caveat this because I'm not an expert, it seems to me Egypt is the exact 100% opposite, where you have a strong state, a very strong state, and you have a group that is you know, saying that it does not want to use violence. Uh, and if you shut them out, do you lead them into other directions? That is something you have to do. Now, I admit there's a little bit of a judgment calls here saying, uh, well, do they mean it when they say they don't want to use violence, or are they just using democracy as an instrument to take power, in which case then they will use violence. That is a judgment call on every circumstance that you needs to be made, but I accept the thrust of, of your question.
summer schools here, oh. in which we um, we do advanced Arabic. Yeah, I know. I was thinking of myself of coming once. Yeah, um, we'd be interested in talking to you and your yeah, colleagues right. or your interns. You yeah, interns in language training. We we, we do have with a lot of our people. Oh, really? To our schools. Oh. And that would be great. If the institute is interested, that would be in fantastic. Interns, new, fantastic. New staff, I will definitely there. That's because our people are people who, who you know, we have like 280 applicants. We pick like eight, right. and it's a highly select group, and they're really serious people. The some of them have some Arabic, but we always would like people to improve. At the same time, we're working with CSIS, and this would be another thing. Wow, that would be a. That, that's for the talk. Well, that's uh, it's a wonderful opportunity. I'd like to uh, take it to my director and uh, it's, it's, director of research. It's likely that uh, you're, you know, you get too many emails and then. No, but this is real. I like this one. It's, it's just very. That's a great front. offer. And um, if you would email me, yeah. then I could be sure to be on your email. Okay. To just confirm. All this right. Offer. I will probably pass it on to my director, uh, Ron perfect. Fatloff or Patrick Faulkner. So I would hope if you don't hear from me. Here from one Sattler. of those two, Rob okay. Sadloff and Patrick Rob. Because that's exactly the sort of stuff yes. that I'd recommend for us. Exactly. Language training. Perfect. Thank you. Sanjani, who's always often touted as a pragmatist, said at a mosque, we're a big country, we should fire it at them, and then if they hit back, we'll still have most of our country intact. And he said that during a mosque. I, I can get that to you if you want. He wrote that during the, uh, it was during the Intifada. I'll give you the exact quote. And he said, well, he said it in a mosque, or he said it. Uh, but, but, but maybe not. No, I, I, don't, I don't take that as a given, but I'm saying that these other, these other elements, I think, and I'm not even talking about things like intimidating the oil markets and stuff like that. I mean, I just think it'll, it, it will embolden the executive much more. You don't have to believe that Iran is going to fire a rocket at Israel tomorrow to see this in, in a negative light. Some people think, well, the United States should have saved Iran, hit oh, yeah. Israel, then Israel, then the U.S. will say an attack on Israel is not a great result like attack on America. I think Israel still will get hit. Who knows? Yeah. It could hit back. It doesn't need that. So. But even having it as a deterrent. Yeah. Could embolden. Yeah. I mean, what I mean, like for example, does Egypt want it then? And then uh, Saudi and Turkey. I mean, there'll be a lot of places. Then we'll have a nuclear Middle East. I mean, one Arab said to me, he said, "Look, we know it's all the bomb, but Israel keeps the bomb in the basement. So if we think Iran has it, they will use it to uh, to embolden rejectionists elsewhere." It's scary. That's why I think it's worth it to try to talk to them and try to work right. it out. Right. So what do you lose? Yeah. Just was it part of the talk that of in the ninth well yeah. our peace we were not able to accomplish something that we wanted right. to because of, because of Khomeini. So That's right. Right. this time even this time around, if it's Hillary or if it's Obama yeah. or someone who's more of a reformer, how it won't, how it won't make, make, make a difference. difference. You ultimately Putin will come in like the Supreme Leader. 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 That to me is what he's gonna do. You gotta strip away all the other stuff. You gotta, it doesn't really matter. One guy's got a business card, so he's not covered. So he's called president. But he doesn't decide. So, I mean, what's the call these things? I mean, I would like to sugarcoat it. No. Because you're not, I, I, I prefer to say, that's the way it is. Thank you. Just leave you.
Someone else came up with me.